speaker. Uh, we have James Murray, an assistant professor at the University of Oregon. He'll be presenting work related to his recent bioarchive paper, paper which we'll share uh, a link to in the chat. And his uh, work is titled, Remembrance of Things Practiced, Fast and Slow Learning in Cortical and Subcortical Pathways. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Adam. Uh, okay, so uh, I recently started just this fall as a new assistant professor at University of Oregon in my lab. We're very interested in um, issues related to motor control and learning and especially the intersection of those things. And what I'm gonna talk about today is a theory of practice. So when we practice a behavior, uh, multiple things are happening. Most obviously our performance improves, uh, but maybe less obviously we also form habits. Um, and in experiments, this can be defined as a reduced sensitivity to goals and rewards. Um, and uh, behaviors become more automatic. This can be thought of as a reduction in cognitive load or an increased ability to multitask. In experiments, this might be probed by having participants do a sequence of finger movements while counting backwards from 100 by sevens or something like that. And the questions I wanna ask today are, are these all different things or are they just different facets of a single underlying process? And second, how might they be implemented in the brain? So in order to probe these questions, we've teamed up with um, the Olvecki Lab at Harvard University. We'll actually have a talk on some of this work by Stefan Wolf later in the session. And uh, in a recent series of papers, they've been uh, training rats to perform this relatively simple task in which the rat has to press a lever twice with a precise time delay between presses in order to obtain a water reward. And here's what learning looks like. After 10,000 trials or so, the rat finally uh, gets this and can produce this target interval reliably. And the group has been asking, uh, what is the involvement of different uh, brain areas, different parts of the motor circuit in this particular behavior? In particular, they focused on three areas. The first is the sensory motor striatum, uh, dorsolateral striatum in rodents uh, for aficionados. The second is the motor cortex. And the third is thalamus, namely the parts of thalamus that project to sensory motor striatum. And they asked what happens, you know, in addition to other things, they asked what happens uh, when you lesion or remove uh, one of these three sources of input. And starting with striatum, if you remove sensory motor striatum in a trained rat, then the rat loses the ability to perform the behavior and never regains it, indicating that the striatum is important for producing this behavior, we think via uh, projections through uh, brain stem and onto spinal cord. If you do the same thing in thalamus, then the same uh, result is obtained. Namely, the animal loses the ability uh, to perform the behavior and never regains it. Uh, if you do the same thing in motor cortex, however, the effects are a little bit more subtle. So first, if you take a trained animal that's already learned and you remove motor cortex, uh, and for technical reasons, the lesion has to be done in two stages, then uh, the rat is perfectly able to perform the behavior. Uh, just as well as before, which may be surprising if you think a motor cortex is playing the role of producing movement, as we often do. If, however, you take a naive animal and you uh, lesion motor cortex, then the animal is never able to learn the behavior no matter how much uh, it tries practicing. So together, this suggests that the motor cortex is important for learning the behavior, but not necessarily for executing it after it's been learned. So this is our minimal model of the motor circuit inspired by these experiments where the experiments show that the thalamic pathway is always necessary, that the motor pathway is necessary only for learning but not for execution. And so as uh, theorists, our job was to uh, come up with a model that would explain this result. And so our model has um, a bunch of neurons in each of these three areas with downward projections along these two pathways. And we think of the output of striatum as determining the behavior. And um, the model that we developed invokes different forms of synaptic plasticity in these two pathways in order to explain this asymmetry and results between the cortical and the thalamic pathways. Namely, we have supervised learning in the first pathway, supervised meaning that its job is to minimize errors or to maximize rewards. Uh, if you want to know about how this generalizes to reinforcement learning, you can ask me about that later. Um, and, and then we have associative learning or heavy in learning in the second pathway. Uh, and this is blind to information about errors and rewards. Its job is just to reinforce associations between the input 
uh, in the output neural activities. So this is work that was done together with Shauna Scola at Columbia University. Um, it's on BioArchive now, and it'll be coming out soon in print. So let's start with the very simplest version of this theory. This is a perceptron, basically. It's a single neuron in striatum um, with a, a binary state, and it's getting inputs from cortex. And the task we want to solve is, let's take a random uh, pattern in cortex and ask striatum to produce some output, either zero or one. And we will update these synaptic weights in order to make striatum produce the correct output for pattern one. And then we'll move on to the next pattern and, and the third pattern and so on. And we'll train all the patterns sequentially, which means that there's potential for, for overriding of old information as new information is acquired. Uh, and then after training on P patterns, we will test on all of those patterns. So we can quantify the behavior with a forgetting curve. And so this is going to plot the, the error rate. So how likely is this neuron uh, to be wrong in the, the output that it produces as a function of which pattern we're looking at. So we expect the error rate to be low for recently learned patterns over on the right and to be close to chance level for old patterns that have been overwritten by subsequent learning. And so we can simulate or, or calculate this curve and it looks something like this, like what we'd expect. I'll just mention that the, the mathematical theory for calculating this turns out to be um, uh, rather rich. It's a drift diffusion model in a high dimensional space of synaptic weights. Uh, if that sounds like fun to you, then, then please see the appendix of our paper for details. So um, that is with just the first pathway. What do we get uh, extra if we add the second pathway in this model? So still just considering a single neuron, let's present a random input pattern. And then we're going to make updates in the first pathway in order to produce the right output. And in the second pathway, um, we're also going to make, make updates uh, just in order to strengthen associations between the input and the output. And so we make updates in both pathways initially, but then if we present the same pattern again, we don't need to update the first pattern anymore because it's already done its job. Um, but the second pattern is going to keep beefing up this association um, the more times that the pattern is presented. And so that, that's what makes these uh, two pathways different. And we can ask what happens to the forgetting curves. So here I'm going to um, present most of my patterns just one time during training, but for a few patterns, I'm going to present them 10 times in a row during training. So those patterns are going to be special. And we see that for most of the patterns, the forgetting curve is the same as before. Uh, the curve from before is the black dotted line here. But for these special patterns that were presented many times, uh, we have a big enhancement, uh, which we can think of either as, a, as an improved error rate, if we read this vertically, or as an improved memory, if we read this horizontally, where patterns are retained much longer than they otherwise would be with a low error rate. And that's because of this uh, beefing up of synaptic weights in the second path pathway through practice. And so that's how practice, uh, the concept of practice enters this theory. Uh, in our theory, uh, practice, uh, uh, corresponds to sort of uh, consolidating these behavioral memories in this dynamic pathway. So um, let's now move from a single neuron in striatum to a population of neurons described by some population activity vector Z, which is determined by uh, its inputs along the first pathway and the second pathway. We'll call those vectors M and H. And we can think of these as, as three vectors in this high dimensional space of um, neural activities. And two things happen um, if we think of it in this way. The first is what I'll call input alignment. And that means that all of these vectors are going to become aligned with one another as I repeat a particular pattern uh, multiple times. And that's, that's because um, of this reinforcing associations in the second pathway that it causes these vectors to align. And, um, and so what that means is that these two input pathways become sort of redundant after practice has happened a lot. And uh, you know, that sort of foreshadows the, the result that we want to show about uh, motor cortex lesion and why motor cortex might not be important um, after learning. The second uh, effect that I want to point out is what we call control transfer. So here we have the projection along the activity vector of these two vectors, the orange one and the blue one. And if they're normalized so that they sum to one, we see that the orange vector is increasingly responsible for driving the activity in striatum as a pattern is learned more and more. So we say that there's a transfer of control from the first pathway to the second pathway as a pattern is repeated. 
so that after you've repeated a behavior many times, it's really your thalamus that's running the show, um, not your cortex anymore, according to this theory. So let's go back to our forgetting curves and suppose that we have one particular pattern that we've uh, practiced many times and everything else is practiced just once. With an eye toward the, the rat experiments, we can imagine that this is the lever press behavior and, and these are everything else that the rat is uh, doing in its life. So we look at the quantity that I just plotted. Uh, this shows that the projection of the thalamic input along Z is pretty modest for most of the patterns, but for this one particular pattern, it's close to one, indicating, as I said before, that the thalamus is really the driver of activity and striatum for this one particular pattern. Uh, we can plot the forgetting curve, and it looks like what I showed before. So after we've trained on all these patterns, we test on them, and we find that this one pattern is retained very well because of the practice effect. And then we can ask what happens when we remove one of these two inputs. So if we remove the motor cortical input, um, we see that this pattern is still retained very well. And, and that's because of this control transfer that's taking place, whereby the thalamic input is responsible for driving activity in striatum. If, however, we remove the thalamic input, we find that this pattern is not retained um, and that it's overwritten because we constantly have um, fast learning and overriding in the motor cortex. And we haven't consolidated this memory um, or we've lost the, the consolidated version of this memory in the thalamic pathway uh, when we remove that input after training. And this should harken back to the experimental results that we started off wanting to explain. Um, and this is kind of a, a post-diction of the theory since that's what we wanted to explain uh, when we started. But we also made a couple of predictions uh, in our theory. And I'll talk about one of those because it's uh, uh, Subsequently, uh, a new paper has, has provided some evidence for it. And it concerns this idea of control transfer, where um, inactivating cortex after fast learning but before slow learning uh, should impair behavior. So uh, what does that mean? So in the theory, remember that fast learning in the first pathway uh, causes the performance to plateau early on, uh, whereas slow learning in the second pathway causes this control transfer that's much more gradual with the thalamic pathway taking over after many repetitions. And so the experimental results that I showed uh, and that Stefan will talk about later uh, address these two cases uh, at the end points where motor cortex is important uh, initially because it's required for this fast learning, but in highly overtrained animals, it's, it's expendable because this control transfer is taking place. An interesting question is what happens in the middle where learning has already uh, plateaued, but this covert learning process is not yet completed. And so the Komiyama lab- James, you have, one, you have one minute left. So I'm at 14 now? Okay, um, so this is my last slide. Um, so uh, the Komiyama lab has trained mice in this targeted joystick press experiment. Um, and here's what the behavior looks like, like the green curve, it plateaus here. And then they inactivated motor cortex at different stages in learning. Um, early and late in learning, they find what we would expect, namely motor cortex is important here and not important here. Um, midway through learning, they find that motor cortex is still necessary, even though the performance is plateaued, uh, which suggests that, that they might be seeing something like this covert learning process. Okay, so just to summarize, I started off asking whether these are all different things or different aspects of the same thing. And according to our theory, um, you know, motor cortex is necessary for fast learning involving performance and then habit formation and automaticity correspond to this transfer of control uh, from a cortical to a subcortical pathway. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, be happy to wrap up and take questions if there's time for one. Thanks a lot, James. That was really, really great. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions live, but uh, if you we just monitor the chat, if anyone has questions for James, uh, please post them in the chat. Um, he'll be around for that. Uh, we'll move on to our next uh, speaker now.